according to Japanese law, you're considered a grown-up as soon as you turn 20. But this isn't the case. When I turned 20, I was still in front of a television, critically hitting metal slimes in the Dragon Quest I bought from the used game store. I was setting when I got frustrated. A real grown-up wouldn't have reset. Well, those were choice words from Kasuya Suramaki, who was the director of Fulu Kulu. That was his directorial debut, after starting at the studio probably about a decade beforehand. He was from animator, episode director, to assistant director, then Arno's number two. Suramaki was given a chance to direct whatever he wanted as reward for all his hard work. It was a daunting task, in which he spent way too much time thinking about it. Oh, time was up. Garnex needed a follow-up to change the foundation of what the studio was at. And that ended up being Kari Kano. For example, the rhythmic insertion of cuts in the flow. You can break up the cuts to make the flow more pleasant, or leave the cuts that should normally be included. There is also the difference in size between the close-up and the panoramic shots of the characters, and a particular stoicism. The stoicism is related to the fact that I dare not move the film. Originally, this was a directing method that I developed in order to distribute resources well, so the schedule and the quality of the TV series would not collapse. After that, I went in the opposite direction, moving things around. This was the case with Kari Kano and Fuli Kuli as well. Suramaki agreed to help out in the first half, and then he'd surely go off and start this new project finally, right? Right? Before we get into any of that, this video is sponsored by Squarespace, a website platform for people in digital spaces who are looking to make nice little websites for themselves. Recently, I've made myself a nice art and animation uh, website here, but what if I wanted to make a blog post about my mommy from Foodie Cooley on the website and her silly little antics? Talking about things like episode two being inspired by mazes and monsters. Well, if I use a pre-built layout, I can make a little blog inside my website. Using it as a pre-built base, and then I could use the Fluid Engine to give it a couple touches up, make it a little fresher. And while I'm at it, why don't I add a Mamami gallery of all the most relevant go-hard images that I'm talking about? And make it look real professional while I'm at it, because that's what you can do. So check out Squarespace to get your free trial today, and when you're ready to launch, you can get 10% off by using my code, www.squarespace.com slash Stephen, on your first website or domain. Thank you very much, Squarespace. Let's get to Fooly Cooly. So yeah, don't want to swear the details. It's not that important. You've got six episodes. Just put everything you're interested in it. Just cram it all down and see if it works in the end. We'll figure it out, right? That's how it's going to be. But before we get into it too much, let's talk about my very personal story about how I came to be a Fooly Cooly fan. So, I was 12 years old, and I'm scrolling through this bootleg anime site. I'm going down it alphabetically, and I suddenly see Fooly Cooly. I'm like, boom. Hey, isn't that the show I saw on that guy with the glasses? Maybe I should check it out. And I watched the first episode, and it hits me. Erm. That was weird. And I never watched any more for decades to come. That was a beautiful coming-of-the-age story. Very emotional. Wow. From one of my favorite stations, Adult Swim, which does not exist in England. Look, this is not going to be one of those kind of videos. I'm sure there's already plenty of them. What I find interesting in Fooly Cooly is more so how it affected Gainax's history. If Karikano lit the match, FLC blew the fucking room. It was constantly frantic, an explosion of animation and energy that was far removed from Evangelion's sort of existential crisis. Surumaki was aiming for something a bit lighter, Maybe with a new style of aesthetic, with Sadamoto moving towards a sensibility closer to Mayoko Arno's, with these sort of drooping eyes with sketchy lines and a very particular fashion sense. But when it came to the tone, it was more a story about losers, a little more bittersweet, something closer to Young Magazine's sign-in papers, where these were more tragic stories about teens and their twisted and dark sort of events that happened to them, and there probably isn't going to be a nice little ending to it all. Look, that kind of fit the vibe of the studio, who themselves are self-proclaimed, insecure, bitter young men. A lot of them also started at Karikano, and they followed through onto this project. But there was no way that they could do this alone as a studio. They needed production IG to partner with them. These were completely different approaches to animation, headbutting against each other, the more realist and grounded approach of production IG, and the sort of off-the-wall now cartoon antics of Gainax. Somehow they made it work though, they found an equilibrium, even with big boys at the studio like Toshiyuki Inoue saying it was a perfect mix of both, an ideal anime in that situation. And it's not even funny how many all-star animators are on this lineup. Starting with Shinji Otsuka, known for his work at Studio Ghibli and being one of the best animators at the studio who can do pretty much anything. 
But he ended up at IG at the time to work on a couple of movies. And now he's here, but on the other side of the spectrum, bringing a sort of extremely cartoony and playful energy to his cuts. Because, as he said, anything goes in Foodie Cooley, and it must be a nice respite from all that very strict work at Ghibli. What about Shinya Ohira? Known for mecha work, but also being one of the most unique animators in Japan. A true legend, but also horribly off-model in Foolie Cooley. Ohira was at the studio under contract, so he just happened to end up on the show. And at first they thought, oh, we could give him some robot action, but he wanted this porch scene. Imaishi was the animation director for the second episode, and for young animators like him, Ohira is like a superior figure. He's incredibly skilled. So... He was too intimidated and couldn't make corrections to the animation. <laughs> and look, I, I don't blame Imaishi for not correcting it. You know, they meant a joke of it in the end. But you can also see in Imaishi's own description of his role within the show, he feels uh, deeply unqualified next to all the other animators there. So I don't really blame the position of feeling maybe not quite up to the task. And also, correcting Ohira sounds like a nightmare. But it does show that there's just a variety of approaches at the show, and there really isn't a very strong model to begin with from episode to episode. And oh, here's actual cuts of fucking king shit, you know? So while we're on it, can we just talk about the animation director, Imaishi, the young man himself who was baptized in the chaos of Karikano? He was even supposed to direct a whole episode, but it was never meant to be just because that schedule was so terrible. But since Karikano, he is more experienced having episode direction credits on Melobots and also defining his visual quirks clearly. When we started Fuli Kuli, we were thinking of using Hiramatsu and Hiroyuki Imaishi as our weapons. Hiramatsu sounds original strength is more delicate and subtle, like those of World Masterpiece Theatre. Imaishi Kun is famous as a follower of Yoshinori Kanada, drawing fluttering movements and extreme jumps without any in between frames to create tempo and action. He's working on it all over the place, if that be episode 2 animation direction or episode 5 where not only is he the animation director but he boarded the whole thing himself and it erupts with many of his ideas that were added in there and it certainly feels at a huge contrast from the prior episode. He's just pulling out crazy stuff like this John Woo shootout which he key animated himself. This is just how the second generation of Gainax went, they had moved far past that point in their early grounded period. In fact many of these animators were still in school when Daikon 4 was wowing everyone, so they wanted to make their own. In my mind, the combination of cool music and animation is exemplified in Daikon 4. The approach of the show was already like a music video anyway. In its format, it can be fast and frantic, and even structurally, pretty close. The show bounces between quiet, loud, quiet, like it was a rock anthem. And all that energy is rare to see in something outside of shorts, like Eternal Family. Even if the structure does remain the same, each episode can feel like it's its own specific song from a different band, having that real mixtape quality. The soundtrack happened to be a mixtape from one of Tsurumaki's favourite bands who just so happened to be on the same record label that was funding Foolie Cooley, The Pillows. They were an underground Japanese band with sensibility towards American alternative and distorted guitars. They gave Tsurumaki free whole albums to use and place and mix wherever he wanted in the show and he put in as much as possible and it became pretty much synonymous with the anime. It's pretty much a very iconic part of it and to find that sort of sour teenage edge of it all, especially when it came to the songs and how they were edited into the animation. Very well with explosions of animation that mix that sort of melody and noise together effortlessly. And you can see that really emphasized in, say, for example, the ending theme, which really became very iconic and goes hard as hell with that riff. It was quite unconventional for an anime to use a soundtrack like this from a band, especially with voice tracks. But Tsurumaki and Gainax weren't really bothered about that kind of thing, and neither were the Pillows. They've been compared to the Pixies a fair bit, but they don't resonate with that comparison. They're more into the bassist, Kim Deal, and her other band, The Breeders, which is actually their favourite band. And Kim herself was a very important part of the early sound of the Pixies during their most acclaimed albums. And when you look at Fuli Kuli, there's a lot of people on the staff who probably also haven't got the recognition they deserve. Right, so this video has actually been edited by Gil Lies here, who's really been helping out on this tight deadline we have, so thank you very much, you've done a great job, Gil. And i got to thank my patrons too while we're here. So I've got to give an apology also to Paul, who I forgot to say in the last video, my bad, I missed you out even though you're in every video. Um, I also was on his podcast once, so you should check that out over here, nice little discussion. Anyway, that is 
Lenny, Tim Jones, Richard, Strato Jones, Stratos, Trunks, J, Fox Mulder, OT, Paul, gotta say it again, Steam's Mum, Sub Sofa, Systematic, Karen, Nick, Doji, Peter, Yegor, Big Boss, DTB, and Gambaroni. Thank you all. Hope everyone's enjoying Steam's Anime Corner series, and we'll get back to the video real soon. That was good only because the staff were good. Suramaki's more so deprecating humour shows itself when he talks about the success of the show. He certainly had a lot of people to help him, like one of the most iconic art directors, Hiramasa Ogura, who painted many of the IG's backgrounds and their most iconic stuff, say for example this ad for Irish Scotch. <laughs> If you're the art director like him, you hold down the aesthetic of all the backgrounds and the sort of energy the show's going to release. For Fuli Kuli, he brought that corrosive yellow skies and the town covered in a distorted fog. And apparently it didn't really have that many high demands for him, so he was happy to take on the role, even though it's not his usual kind of thing. Tsuramaki wanted the show to look like Oni Guy Samai Don. He wanted the art to have a direction that's slightly more comedic, but you know, with some nice colours. And they adjusted their colours of their animation towards what the art direction eventually became. So it's safe to say that Ogura's art direction is very important for the overall atmosphere. With one other factor that helped define that being digi-paint. Fulikuli was the first of Gainax to be painted digitally. They kept the colours nice and simple and flat in response to the art direction. They made it quite a seamless transition, you might not even know it unless you're told. But as an early adopter it had some issues, you know, when it came to its release on things like DVD, the noise and compression were a problem. It's generally now better on Blu-ray, but there's kind of still a lack of sharpness when it comes to uh, the show because it doesn't quite have the resolution it needs to be pushed up into those newer high-definition areas. Maybe that'll be fixed in the future. Although there are benefits to this new digital world, take for example the manga scenes, the digital zooms, whip pans, noise all over, the actual drawings composited into it all, these things were just not possible in the traditional world. You can even see the difference if you look at Kari Kano's last episode. What about the help of CGI to do things like the visceral 360 spin, where they used wireframes and the background being completely of a different dimension to break realism to the point of being very comedic? I guess this is where you can say that balance Inoue was talking about is, which would only be possible through the fact that it was released one episode at a time in the OVA format. With a timeline which there were some struggles in, but you know, that's just the guy next way, they were duct taping their way through it all. It's still a two-year production, which is probably a lot better than, say, for example, the Kari Kano situation they just came out of. But it doesn't mean there weren't parts where they were smacking Imaishi for his boards or trying to get him up to date, because he was all over here, if that be on animator or border. That bathroom scene in episode four is pure him, especially since he did the cut. If he didn't board it, he certainly made it look like he did with the change in colors, shading, and composition. <laughs> Beyond Tsurumaki, each episode director and animation director brought something to their section. You know, when you talk about someone like Nobotoshi Ugura, who only worked on one episode, but he brought a vulgarity and horror tone to his boards and animation direction, that really stick out. With the team also adding a bunch of other stuff there, which weren't there originally. There's some stuff he wanted to do that's so nasty, I can't even mention it here. You're going to have to read Fuli Kuli Noise to figure that one out. When it comes to the episode director for said episode, Masahiko Otsuka went on to become the president of Studio Trigger. Even if he was only just an episode director at this point, and relatively young, many of the people who were on Fuli Kuli went on to become part of that group. And that's the thing about Gainax at that time, it was an environment where young staff had the ability to be allowed to work in such creative ways and in such high places. I was very lucky in that respect, because that's just the kind of organisation Gainax is. If it had been some conservative studio I was with, Fuli Kuli would never have been any more than an idea. It wasn't just creative, but also, I guess, hornier. I mean, certainly there's a puberty angle going on with the characters that sets up to a degree, but come on, let's not forget who these people are. They work at Gainax after all, and then Trigger. Surumaki has his own thought in that area too. Even though he's a bit shy about expressing it, he has his interests, let's say. The heart of Moe lies in undersized pajamas. If it means losing to a cute girl like this, I'd lose over and over again. I gotta give it to the writer too. I'm sure he's not innocent on that one. And Akido Yoji. He worked on Evangelion, but also was the brains behind revolutionary girl Utena, so I'm sure there's some interesting things going on there. 
He also helped work on the media mix. You know, he wrote the novels and the manga, which are both different variations of the story. The manga especially takes the different way visually, which is quite interesting in how it takes advantage of its medium instead. But, you know, likely because there's such a short period, there was a lot of stuff that was left on the cutting room floor, which we've seen. And I'd say that makes it pretty hard to market when you look at the final product. But King Records made so much money from Evangelion, they'd greenlight anything at that point. It was a very lucky period for them. So this constantly moving and switching piece, which is pretty dense and might leave the audience some scratching the head on the finer details. Well, that could just go through. Though some of them might have got the wrong idea, because if you look at something like Evangelion, the mystery of it was quite pivotal for the Japanese discussion. The Fuli Kuli mystery isn't something where you can really detail it out in a grand manner. While you can piece together the logic, a lot of it is left vague or intentionally so, because it, a lot of it doesn't really matter in comparison to, say for example, just the surreal territory the characters are thrown into and their emotional responses to that. Especially when you like look at the Adult Swim audience, they sort of sometimes plug on to the coming of age story. He's still got to work through the biggest challenge of all. Puberty. Which, you know, if you look at the soundtrack and the sentiment it's approaching it with, it can really fit in with that sort of slacker style content you see from the 90s. It does feel like a time capsule, but in a way where it's kind of easy to miss where the Japanese elements of that come from. Like, a lot of those random Japanese references aren't already in the American dub, but when it comes to the bigger things like uh, the impending apocalypse, and how that was affected by things like the Kobe earthquake or the arm attacks, because in those moments when everything's close to the end, and you save the world, no, you don't get the go. You have to still go back to your old routine, like you always have. Nothing ever changes here, right? Besides the secret tokusatsu stuff. Yes, and the concept here really comes from that endless everyday, which was defined by Miyadai Shinji. The same thing happens every day. If you're well sustained and you have no direction in life, you will feel trapped by that sentiment of everything repeating and nowhere to go. It's also a sentiment that would define a toku culture with its rise of the apocalyptic imagery that people would escape into. And what is Gainax but a hive of otaku? But the endless everyday saw some cracks in the post om Japan. It certainly became less obvious about what is certain. Fulu Kuli would dabble in this world ending destruction, but in ways that are pretty much amount to smashing toys and tokusatsu miniature explosions. There was no real causality to any of it. In spite of those who worry that the end is nigh, it doesn't distract from all the things you have to do, like going to school or going to the convenience store, a true model of the endless every day, which features predominantly in episode 2. And it's just those little references to magazines, soda cans, and pinups, it all relates back to consumer culture that rules over everything, even in the so-called apocalypse, you still have vending machines. In Cynic Link's video on Fuli Kuli, he also covers the repeating everydayness and the circular story structure of Fuli Kuli, so you should check it out. Ultimately, Nauta is just a kid, and the series starts as it ends. Even if his tastes have changed a little bit, and he's older and bolder, we still don't know shit, and nothing makes sense, and the grown-ups all suck, and that sourness is what you're left with. So I don't really see Fuli Kuli being too concerned with growing up, especially with what Suramaki said about his 20s, or what he said when he was directly asked about the series. Fuli Kuli is a piece of work that asks the question, what does it mean to become an adult? After 10 years, have you found the answer to this? Oh no, I really don't know. For this video, when I watched Fuli Kuli with friends and we just sat down, you kind of get comfy and there's a vibe to it and you can just sort of hold down on that strictly audiovisual level and it's just kind of holistic enjoyment you're just having a, a good time with friends i get the vibe you know i mean look, look come on look at the notes i wrote when i was watching this like i just drew little pictures and it's like you're being on a completely different planet entirely for some time Alright, the Fuli Kuli staff that went on to make Trigger only went further up the ladder at Gainax and created their own legacy. 
And that can also be said for Surimaki, who was defining his sensibilities and teams as he went from project to project all the way into Kara. And of course, he would be a defining factor as well in making the rebuild movies, as he is still artist number two. Although it's kind of sad that he hasn't really done much else in the last decade besides Evangelion. I wonder why he never made a Fuli Cooley sequel or something. Hmm. Okay, well, outside of the Gynex drama, and, you know, IG now owns it, it's probably not the best idea to get a bunch of 50-year-olds back in the room and pretend they're 20 and try and capture lightning in a bottle again. What you need is a new team with a new sensibility to try and make their own version, which has their own intent and radical change in terms of breaking tradition. And you're not going to get that by making things that feel familiar and repeating the same thing again and again and again. But I guess that's more marketable. Now, in my heart of hearts, the version I'd like to see is some sort of fooly cooly mixtape where each episode's a different studio and a different band and they can just go with it wildly and make an anthology series. But I know that's never going to happen. But you know, if I'm talking about Silver Linings, now Shin Evangelion's over, I know that the next big project at Kara is going to be a Surumaki, maybe original, and I'm very much looking forward to it. And that's probably more optimistic than the ending we've got with Fulikuli. I'll catch you next time.